I am unashamed. What about you? All right, welcome back to Unashamed. I'm still down here at the Southern Lair. So, Jace, I um, so I went to I did some. I, I don't go to the movies much anymore. Did you, do you ever go? Have, when's the last time you've been to the actual <laughs> theater? theater? <laughs> it's been years, not months or weeks. Yeah, Dad, when's the last time you went to a like a movie theater? Actually, went in and years, years, years. Well, Phil, <laughs> no, years. Phil, let me help you out there. <laughs> decades. That's the word. You're decades. Looking for. Decades. Yeah. Yeah, I'm know. years. You're decades. Well, you went to see. I don't know how long. I'd have to look it up when the movie was. But I remember going to the movie. It was you and Mom. It was Mac and Mary. We had Mac Owen on the a podcast recently, and me and Lisa. We went to we went to Ruston. I don't know why I went to Ruston. Maybe it wasn't playing in Monroe, but we saw Apocalypto, which was Mel Gibson's movie, which was fantastic, by the way. Um about the Indian about, tribe of South America. Uh, yeah, about the about the Mayans. Yeah. We went and saw that at the movie and I, and you were with me, so I remember you being there, but that may have been the last time you were at a movie theater. I think so. It was when Whenever that movie was made, so that was it. We could probably trace it back to that because I doubt you've been since then. So uh, we went to uh, see Nefarious, which was Steve Dace's new movie uh, that's out, and uh, I've been wanting to see it. And uh, Zach had sent us a, a link to watch it because uh, you know he's an inside. But Steve is a Blaze host, and so we were going to watch it on the computer. But I got too busy and I missed the link. You know those things; they expire. You can only watch them. So that's so you actually saw it, Dad, on the on Dan's computer. Uh, so you watched it. So I saw it at the theater, and uh, man, it was it was something. I mean, uh, I, I would say it was uh, chilling. Was would would be one of the words I would describe it. It was also very. Um, it was a great way to sort of get a look at the, at the world from the perspective of evil, which I had not thought about. So it was it was it was very well done from that perspective. But um, it was it, it was something. I mean, it, it was <laughs> not for the faint of heart. It was about the theater we were in was a small one of the smaller ones, but it was about half full. But it was you, you could hear a pin drop in there. I've sat down with a lot of people, just me personally, a whole lot. I'd say in thousands. And uh, I've seen more than one that the demoniac was clearly in front of me. I've talked to people who acted like that that dude on Defarious. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Yep. It's a pretty, it's pretty. Uh, I mean, it'll 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 make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. I tell you that. Yeah, That's well, right. your butler. It calls your butler, Dan to call me and he asked me questions about it, which I'm not sure why he didn't ask you, but maybe he did. He just wanted to give me a little briefing on what it was. And I thought, hmm. No, I'm talking about Dan. Yeah. That Dan I'm, called me and he said he had a couple of questions. And uh, of course, one of them was about how or, or why did I think on the pyramids that they seem to have etched airplanes and yep. things with rudders and yeah you see so, that clearly but, so anyway i was like that that question i answered easily which was i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> it is interesting. Well, you, dug deep, you dug deep for that one Jess. <laughs> yeah. but he carved like, <laughs> into rock there's there's so uh, i saw it and i was amazed but i was <laughs> like i have no idea yeah. but the second question was about I guess he had watched that that movie, which I haven't seen the movie. That was back when my email was hacked, so I guess I never got the email. Uh, or yeah, you know. So, uh, but I did look it up on the movie database because I just wanted to see what it was rated as far as you know by people that had watched it. What I found interesting it's a lot like the shows we do. It was either a nine or a ten or a one. Yeah. And so like and the ones cuz I just read the comments, uh, I didn't read them, I just scrolled through them. 
So if it was a one, they were basically they uh, evidently Glenn Beck was on the movie. Yeah, at the yeah. end of the movie, they either didn't like didn't like him, or they thought it was a a, a right wing conspiracy Christianity show that you know. So they were just it wouldn't have mattered if it would have been good or not. They just saw who was in it and said one. But the the all the other comments that they said, you know, it's really good acting, uh, really intense, and a, a lot of the comments I saw is they were wondering why it was rated R because they said it there was nothing really that would would make it R. So uh, I thought that was interesting. But uh, so so Dan asked me, you know, how old. You know, or did I think angels live? That was one part of the question. Uh, two, you know, how in the spirit of the demon, you know, when when did the demon possession change? Or or maybe that's a wrong, uh, for, you know, some translations put demonized or uh, unclean spirit. Or, you know, when you look at those words, it's just a word for being demonized i guess so it it's There's like a lot written about them it's they they're brought up demons demoniac the devil you know it it's it's about almost 100 times mentioned just in the gospels alone no i agree but i do think uh i do think they were limited in some capacity once jesus died and was buried and raised and the Holy Spirit was poured out. I think something happened. Now, I don't think that they necessarily left. I think, but I think they were limited in that if if you uh, surrender to the Lord and receive God's Spirit, you know, because then you get in the later books, you know, it says resist the devil and he will flee from receiving you. Receiving God's Spirit is the common. I mean, is the is the is, is the verse. You need to remember when it yeah. comes to the demoniac, it, you have to get the spirit of God, which in you, which that keeps the evil spirits out of you. Well, right. In my uh, humble opinion, that's one of the, that's help coming from heaven. I mean, think about it. You're not going to get out of a demon. You're not going to get love, joy. You're not going to get peace, patience, kindness, goodness. You, 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 it's not, you're not going to, that, that doesn't come from evil. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's good fruit when you see that. So basically, it's just uh, the when you see the fruit of the spirit, you can tell if it's that or the fruit of the devil himself. It you can spot it easily. There's some some uh, horrific things going on worldwide, and there always has been. And uh, so evil is as real as it can be. I mean, just look around for crying out loud. Yeah. Well, I think about that verse in. Uh... Second Timothy 2 and verse, was it 24, where it says, And the Lord and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, yep. not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, so that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. No doubt about it. So I think that's the strongest verse you'll find in the letters about if you allow, you know, your heart to go down an evil path, then you're setting yourself up for this kind of captivity and, yep. and maybe, so I, I think that's where we're at now. I mean, I don't, I'm interested to hear what you think, Al. But it's worthy of note that Jesus, there are so many in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll see it, but it's coming up on us in a little bit. We're studying uh, Luke. Luke. So you see it there, too. So I would just say, uh, you know, you read that Ephesians 6, uh, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now, this is critically important. You say it's these people that we run up on, you can't 
you, you have to have your eyes wide open when you're talking to them because what we're struggling with, we're against the rulers. So it seems to be organized against the authorities. It seems to be more organized and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's where our struggle is. Well, that's nothing to fool with and take lightly at all. I mean, he's there. I mean, this nefarious, they, they, they gave you a good picture. And I, well, I'll say again, I've talked to a lot of people in the last 50 years, and I've seen some. It, it, I said, whew. I said, man, I mean, it, it's, uh, it was demoniac. It was a demoniac de- demon. We know from the scriptures, we certainly see a lot of the substructure of angelic forces, right? Yep. We know there's archangel. So there's, there's almost a military like structure in the angelic forces. And we see that, you know, we know from Daniel, there's there's fighting that goes on. There's there's these forces a, a against each other. So you know that there's the same some sort of structure in the same way on the evil side. So which the movie kind of got into that in terms of titles and structure. So there's all that that has we know has gone on from us from a scriptural point of view. So spiritual forces, you know, are lined up and they're there. And you, yep. and it's clear from scripture, and so you see that, and so you know when you see that battle that goes on, it rages, and so you know when my theory has always been that when Jesus was here, and there were all these questions about why he was here, that that's why you saw it kind of bubble up even more so, probably, you know, to the surface, and you saw that even more. So I think that's why there's so much going on. I've heard human beings in a joking matter say but the devil made me do it the devil made me do it well right. i take that very seriously right no me too very That's seriously right. it's, it's definitely not something to joke around we know that nope. even from jude right we want to take this very seriously satan and his forces is no joke that That's much exactly i have right. learned in 50 years talking to people about how to get get satan get, get, out from the clutches of Satan. It, yeah, exactly. It's, it's well, I think there's a fine line because, you know, you know, I think back in this day, which it never, you know, of all the demon possession stories that you read in the Gospels, it never tells really about what happened before their life. It You just come up on the scene and there's a guy in a, you know, chained to a, to a graveyard. And also, uh, you don't read much about... God stepping in or Jesus stepping in and and blowing them all to bits, killing them. Yeah. No. Right. He, it, it's not like he, you know, he threw the, the, the well, Jesus, he, Jesus, you know, showed he had the power to cast them out and I don't know lo- whether loved them and, uh, you know, redeemed them. I mean, well, you remember Mary Magdalene? I mean, she, it just, it doesn't tell her story, but it, mentions that he had driven out seven unclean spirits from her at some point in her in her life. I mean, which is, she was one of his closest followers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so we're going to take a break, and uh, we got a real treat here today because we got the man, uh, Steve Dace, who, has, uh, who is behind Nefarious, and we've been talking about it a lot because we've been talking about the movie, and so he is going to be right here to tell us about this movie and some spiritual war- warfare, which is what we've been talking about. So let's take a break. We come out on the other side. Uh, Steve's going to join us to talk about this project and a lot of other stuff, so uh, let's take a break. So, Jace, did you know what the traditional 15th anniversary gift is? You know, there's like a you know, some are diamonds, some are gold. Did you know what the one for the 15 year is? Just curious if you knew that. No, that was uh, like 15, over 15 years ago in my marriage. So, oh, okay. I'm sure you knew back then. So yeah. the, tr- the traditional 15th anniversary gift is crystal. Mm. So our old friends, Tommy John, who are sponsors of the podcast, they're celebrating their 15th year. And so they're making it crystal clear 
that you deserve to be comfortable every day. Did you see what I did there with that, Jace? Yep. Crystal clear. Amazing. Yep. Yeah, that's right. That's why I'm sitting in this chair. Uh, So anyway, their 15th anniversary uh, for making fantastic, breathable, lightweight underwear that we all enjoy. Uh, And I have for years, because when you're a Tommy John fan, uh, you're really a fanatic. They've sold over 20 million pair, thousands of five star reviews. Uh, They don't like I said, they don't really have customers. They have fanatics. And, uh, and I've enjoyed them for years. They have a best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee, uh, which is pretty good. But trust me, you won't send them back. Uh, you get 20% off your first order if you go to TommyJohn.com slash Phil. So that's 20% off TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. All right, so we're back with Steve Days. Steve is a is a fellow uh, Blaze host, uh, which is great. He's uh, he has co-authored uh, and authored many books. He's a fellow believer uh, and an unashamed proclaimer of the gospel. And Steve, welcome to the Unashamed Podcast. We should have had you on before now, but uh, belatedly welcome uh, to uh, to Unashamed Podcast. It's an honor. Guys, and I don't know if I ever told you this, but back when I was uh, writing for USA Today, when they would still uh, employ people like me, <laughs> now we are unfathomable to even consider. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when when Phil had the whole uh, thing where I think it was GQ, where you just recited the birds and the bees and everybody lost their bowels over that, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and they tried to cancel you all. Uh, I actually wrote the column for USA Today at that point in time defending you guys. <laughs> And it was the second most read column of that year for USA Today. So it's a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> oh my goodness! So, so Steve, I, I so I, I was when I was researching a little bit about your stuff you had done. Obviously, because we all know about the movie, which is what we're going to talk about. But so I sent that article to Dad and had Dan because you know Dad doesn't do computers uh, mm-hmm. or phones, and so I had I had Dan print it for him. And so when we came on air this morning, Dad <laughs> Dad said. And he didn't have his earphones on, so he couldn't hear me. He said, you know, for some reason, Al sent me an article that Peter Ducey at Fox News wrote about me a few years ago. I, and I didn't even know uh, about it. Of course, I don't know I where started. Peter Ducey can. Isn't he the weatherman? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, was, I saw him on Fox News one time. I got so tickled. Hey, 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 don't get me tangled up in this, all this high tech world. I'm, 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 I'm standing back so, behind it. No. So, Steve, so you were, so you were uh, mistaken for Peter Ducey this morning. So yeah, I thought that's that was right. pretty funny. You get a kick that out of it. That is funny. Yeah, thank you. I don't things know if Peter would find it funny, up. but I do. Yes, things are clearing up the further we go this morning. I'm yeah, looking you're getting some clarity, <laughs> Phil. That's good. But welcome but it to is. the computer world. I'm not used to it yet, my man. So, Steve, we do owe you a uh, belated ten year thank you for that d- defense uh, of us in 2013 because I did read that article and it was very good uh, from 2013. So we appreciate that. So I was so before you came on, we were talking in our first segment that I just went and saw the movie here. I'm in Gulf Shores. And so I went and saw the movie here a couple of nights ago in the theater. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, oh, it, thank you. Oh, so good. So well done. So well acted. And there's, there's so many things we want to ask. Of course, we were talking about it in relationship to, you know, spiritual warfare and just, you know, so much to, to unwrap and discuss. Uh, but But I just wanted you to tell our audience a little bit about sort of, you know, what your thinking was making the film. I mean, obviously you, you've written a couple of books that, mm-hmm. that sort of were the basis of it. Right. So tell us mm-hmm. a little bit about just the process because of what landed it here and how it came to be. And then I want to break down a little bit about some of the stuff that's in it. Well, I, I don't want to be a cliche and we, we, we made our movie in a way to break every Christian movie cliche that's ever been done. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it is kind of a, a cliche, but a good one, you know, it's a total God thing. Uh, my, my first trip to Washington, D.C. about uh, eight years ago uh, was to do publicity for my first wide release book. And um, I, I just, you know, got inspired to to write a sequel to the Screw Tape Letters because, um, you know, where else is it better to get inspired to write about a demonic takedown of America than your first trip to Washington, D.C., right? I mean, you're right there at the belly of the beast. And I um, I wrote this book called A Nefarious Plot. 
uh, about a high lord uh, from hell named Lord Nefarious, who was tasked by Satan over a century ago with the takedown and destruction of the United States. And in order to prove to his master that his plan has been successful, he lays it all out in detail, names, names, connects dots, real people, real historical movements, figures, how he did it. Uh, and he puts it all in writing and in our faces because the fact that we won't believe it, we won't turn away from it, um, is, is we're oblivious to it. That's how he'll prove to his master, the devil, that his plan is irrevocable. And now his master may move on to his next stage of dominion with America out of the way. And, um, you know, my show was really young at that point in time. I was in syndication with a network that doesn't even exist anymore. And, and, and so we only sold a, you know, four, five, 6,000 copies. It was a modest, you know, success at that point in time. And I, I just thought, you know, it was a clever idea. Maybe I had, and I was going to move on with my life and see where my career took me. And about six months later, I get a phone call out of the blue from someone I didn't know at the time. Uh, a name everybody knows. Glenn Beck calls me out of the blue. Uh, and he says, hey, a mutual friend of ours gave me your book, man, and it blew my mind. And I'd love to have you on talking about it. And I said, well, Glenn, with all due respect, I, I don't want 10 million people to know about this book I wrote, so I'm going to pass. I was on the very next day uh, for an entire hour. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, driving around Burbank, California that morning was uh, a guy named Chris Jones, who's part of a producer team at what's called it's, uh, Believe Entertainment. And they had been part of the producer team at uh, Pure Flix. Um, the, uh, his other co-producers, guys, you guys know, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Consulman wrote the script for God's Not Dead, which yeah. was a massive success. And they kind of wanted to break out on their own and, 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 and direct their own features now. They were getting set to start pre-production on a movie called Unplanned, which turned out to be a phenomenal film mm -hmm. uh, based on Abby Johnson's memoir of her time at Planned Parenthood. And they were wondering what their next movie was going to be. And they'd always wanted to get into spiritual warfare, Frank Peretti kind of stuff. But how do you do that in a way that doesn't glorify evil yeah. um, at the same time. That's a tough thread to, or, you know, a, a, to needle um, and uh, or tough needle to thread, I think uh, maybe the other way around. And so, you know, they, uh, they heard me talking about this book for an hour. They, they go get the book on Kindle, go back to their office and, you know, they're just blown away. And I get an email that night. My wife's at a women's retreat. Our kids were still uh, younger. So I'm doing dad duty. I put him to bed. I go down to the man cave to play mad and to unwind. And uh, I get this email alert. Uh, hey, my phone says, hey, we, you know, uh, my name's Carrie. We want to buy the movie rights to your book. I was convinced it was a Nigerian prince scam and deleted the email and moved on. <laughs> and, uh, did I, ask, you know, did a little ask you for four hundred dollars to get them out of a, a situation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. yes, yes. And uh, the little voice in the back of your head, your Holy Spirit puts there every now and then so kind of says, eh, you might want to rethink that decision, you know. And so I went and got to the email, looked them up, found out they were real people. And, um, you know, over the next couple of months, we negotiated and had a movie deal. We had to wait for unplanned and that process to go through. And uh, we were going to start right away. And then COVID hit. Uh, and then uh, the, literally the, the week that Gavin Newsom reopened California uh, in, in, in June of 2020, uh, I flew out to Burbank and we spent three days out there storyboarding the movie. Much of that, I'd say 85%, 90 of what we storyboarded is the story that you see in the film. Carrie and Chuck then from there wrote an incredible script. I mean, it's just in, it's just a fantastic script. And, um, and then along the way though, guys, we have had, I can't even tell you literally everything you can imagine. Uh, we had uh, the uh, the IATSE crew union um, in, a, in a right to work state tried to hit us with a frivolous uh, labor lawsuit. And why do I call it frivolous? Because they hit us with multiple counts. Uh, last month, we actually beat them in NLRB court on all counts but one. Okay. And it was the, and, and it was almost like the judge said, Hey, I, I don't want the mob to, to, to burn down my brownstone tonight. So I'm going to find, I'm going to find for the trans woman on set, make sure she gets her $3,500 and back pay. But you think of how frivolous your claim has to be if you lose that badly to a Biden National Labor Relations Board court. Okay. <laughs> wow. I mean, we had uh, Carrie and Chuck both went into the hospital during Delta variant with uh, COVID pneumonia. Men of their age, men of any age, it was a flip of the coin, man, if you were coming out of the hospital for yeah. COVID during that period of time. So we weren't even sure they were going to live. We, we've nearly have been shut down multiple times. Uh, I mean, I, I just, I, <laughs> there was an instance when Carrie and Chuck and the, their, their priest buddy, who's a Vatican trained exorcist, they were uh, staying at an Airbnb in Oklahoma City while we were filming there. 
And uh, one morning they get up and they hear an animal causing a commotion in the home. And they think for sure it's like the left out pizza boxes and stuff because they're no, you know, kind of bachelor padding it. And instead, the, uh, the squirrel went into this room where they had set up an altar for their priest buddy to hold mass every day before they went to shoot the movie. And this squirrel, that's the only room in the home he went into. He went into the, the room where they had the mass altar, completely desecrated it, urinated all over it, defecated all over it, turned everything over, and then ran out of the house. I mean, this thing, and from, I mean, I was in the ER uh, a week ago with a mysterious MRSA bacteria infection of unknown cause and origin that they literally had to carve out of my armpit, armpit of all things. I mean, this has been a crazy journey to yeah. get here. And I think when you guys, I know you've seen the film, you know why, yeah. uh, because it, it's not, I think what we've done, what we've, what we've gotten wrong is that the devil loves to operate in the shadows. I, I think if yeah. you look at our culture right now, he's not operating in the shadows at all, man. I mean, he's, he's out, he's loud and proud. Yeah. I think he likes to, uh, he likes to be in charge of his own branding though. That's different and doesn't want the real veil of who he is and the camouflage taken off for everybody to see. And I think that's what he's opposed to. And, and our film, I think, does a, a very good job of that. And and, and you got to thank Sean Patrick Flannery for really a magnum opus performance in that title role. So, Dad, do you remember when I was uh, 16 years old and I brought in your Browning 16 gauge with a bubble on the barrel? Do you remember that? I remember I that. Uh, vaguely, yeah, I, vaguely. And so I got in big trouble. Uh, and the reason is I didn't understand the importance of having a clean barrel. You always should check your barrel. But you reminded me of that, as I recall, uh, in a very harsh way. Yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember. I mean, you had to teach the young bucks. You don't want to shoot, to pull the trigger when you got mud in your barrel. Or you exactly. come up, you got a pregnant gun barrel. It's just a bulge. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. So I ruined the gun barrel, and I found out the hard way. It's very important to have a clean barrel. Uh, our, our friends and our new uh, sponsor, Barrel Buddy, uh, would have been uh, very good uh, for me to know about back when I was 16 years old. Uh, they've come up with a way to be able to clean your barrel. Uh, the old ways, the old days, they had patches, uh, which weren't very effective. Uh, is they had the boar snake that came along after that. Problem was you can't tell whether your gun is really clean or not. So they've come up with a new product, a multi-stage cleaning. Uh, it has a polymer design scrub, and so it allows you to uh, see the residue that comes out and buffs it clean. Uh, it also is going to lubricate as it cleans, and so you're going to know that it's clean. It's a white polymer so that you can see what comes out of the gun. It's American-made, uh, which we love that. These guys are... Uh, they're believers, uh, which when we first talked to them, they had a prayer with us, which we love that about them. They're a small business. They're like us. They figured it out in the field, how to come up with a great product. So we love these guys. I want you to check them out. You go to BarrelBuddy.com, B-A-R-R-E-L, Buddy, BarrelBuddy.com. Check out their product. Uh, check out this company. You're going to love them. Well, and you know, it's interesting, Steve, because I hadn't thought about this until you just described that because uh, I knew because I kind of been following. So I knew about some of the issues. I didn't know about everything. But it, it's interesting because not only are you talking about going up against spiritual forces in dark places, but also just the nature of the movie. You're also going up against just regular forces of evil that are right in, in plain sight. Mm -hmm. You're right. I mean, mm -hmm. you know what political forces, I mean, all the other things that are also kind of, you know, pulling for the dark side. And I thought it was interesting because you mentioned about darkness and evil. It's not so much Satan being in the dark, but people are in the dark about who's mm -hmm. actually pulling the levers. Right. Which I, mm -hmm. I thought the film really deals with in a powerful way. So I want to ask you, cause so I had some different takes on the film just, and I came right home and jotted these down cause I knew we were going to have you on the podcast. So uh, a few things that I felt like were really interesting and I want to hear to you take on them just sure. from, from my perspective. So one of the things was the film really impacted me because it was a perspective from evil's point of view that I had never thought about. I mean, I, I thought that was so brilliantly done. In other words, you know, we get to actually hear, cause we don't think about it. The idea about what, what, a, what does evil think about, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and I thought the film really dove into that well, because by hearing from this demon, 
in the dialogue back and forth, in, in, you know, in this in these two characters that are that are having this conversation. And it was so intimate is what made it so powerful to me watching the film. You know, he, hearing him use the words when he's speaking of God, this demon, he calls God the enemy, you know, and he calls Jesus the carpenter. And so he never uses their names that we would call them, you know, mm-hmm. as believers. And so I, I just found that fascinating from evil's perspective. And so I don't know, does that, and I haven't read your book, which now I can't wait to get it and read it. I think I actually have it somewhere in my house. I've got to find it and read it. So, so t- talk a little bit about that, about just the idea of looking at things from evil's perspective and how that kind of plays into not only the film, but also into your books. When I, when I wrote the book, um, basically at that stage of my own faith walk, and I, I mean, I got saved when I was 30 years old in 2003. And so I wrote the book about a little bit more than a decade after that. And uh, so everything I'd been in through from discipleship and spiritual training to renew my mind, everything from Augustine to Josh McDowell, uh, it, it's kind of a culmination of those influences. And and I, I thought because I wanted unbelievers to pick it up and understand it, I, I decided to, to, to you know, uh, take... I'm kind of a go big or go home, don't ask for permission, uh, beg for forgiveness kind of guy. Okay. And so I decided to borrow a page out of Milton's Paradise Loss and add some creative license to, of subtext of things that, uh, that might help believers, non-believers understand the fullness of the, of the biblical text. And I, I tried to do it subtly in a way that, you know, didn't interpose my own viewpoints on it. Um, and, and, and to do that was to explain why do they do things if they know they're going to lose, right? If they know they're going to lose, then what is their motivation? And that all comes out in the book. And, and that's, and they, and Carrie and Chuck borrowed heavily from that in the film. Those yeah. themes are addressed heavily in the film right out of the book, that sort of theorem. And, uh, and the idea that, um, they can't, they can't bring themselves to pronounce something of holiness from their own lips. Yeah. Um, it, 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 um, it indicts them, it incriminates them, it yeah. shames them. Uh, and so that's where these monikers like the carpenter uh, in the book, God's referred to as, you know, who or the enemy yeah. uh, or, 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 you know, your daddy, things of that nature, a, a form of demonic in, in philosophy, we call this reductionism. Yeah. The idea of taking a meta point or an eternal truth or an absolute truth and reducing it down so it loses its power, loses its potency, uh, you know, in, amidst moral relativism. And so Carrie and Chuck did a brilliant job borrowing from those themes, uh, that are in my book, uh, as well. And one of the things that really drove all of us, and there's a wide range of theological opinion. I mean, Carrie and Chuck got saved, you know, uh, they're, they're uh, as Catholics in the 70s. They're, they're kind of your charismatic Catholics. I call them Pentecatholics. All right. They're, they're, a, very, <laughs> they're a very interesting concoction of the, theological tribes. Uh, I'm the guy that puts the fun in fundamentalism, man. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. you know, sola, what, you, what, do you, what church do you belong to, Steve? My answer is Sola Scriptura. That's my church. Yeah. All right. That's where I go. All right. And so, and I think we all played off each other with this one desire that we recognize that this culture for a generation has heard the softer side of Sears. It's heard the soft sell. It's heard from all of our buddy priests. It's heard, it's heard from all of our Hawaiian shirt, uh, uh, wearing, uh, uh suburban pastors, mm-hmm. everybody with a, with a cleated, uh, you know, or a pair of pleated khakis. It's heard from them all. It's, it, it's heard from all the buddies it, and it didn't make a dent. It made no dent in what's happening around us at all. Instead, yep. the darkness only grows. And so we all are of one mind on this. It is time for some old time religion now. Yep. Yep. All right. The, it, the, you know, the, the Bible says that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so there's this pendulum for us as believers that we're, this thing can't swing out of balance between grace and truth. And frankly, I think the number one mistake the modern American evangelical church has made is it has put grace and truth at loggerheads. Like you can only show the love and grace of God at the expense of his truth. You can't bring both of those things to bear. And so we're way out of balance now. Um, and, and, and it's time to bring it back more in balance to truth. And so since this culture loves darkness, guys, last year, horror was the number one genre released by Hollywood. 31 horror films were released last year. Counting hours, 35 horror films are slated to be released this year. This is where Gen Z goes. 
this is where they are. And we wanted to go to Nineveh. And so we made a film that looks and sounds like what they are attracted to, but it is a full apologetic from our, of our worldview, but from a figure that frankly, they're much more accustomed to listening to than your Hawaiian shirt, buddy, suburban pleated khaki pastor who is not, who Elon Musk is more of a threat to hell than he is. Okay. With what he, with what he's doing at Twitter, even though, uh, he's a transhumanist. And so, you know, and I've got, I've heard people say, well, you know, we wanted to hear the name of Jesus proclaimed. You, you get to hear a high Lord of hell, mild spoiler. You get to hear a high Lord of hell look into a camera and tell you in, in, in a thousand movie theaters nationwide, quote, the cross was our greatest mistake. Yep. Now, I know we're not used to these things called men in our culture anymore, but brother, I don't know about you. Give me the lamentations of my enemies any freaking day of the week. <laughs> I want to hear that. That's what I want to hear. So, you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, interesting guests uh, on the podcast with a lot that are doing a lot of amazing things. And one of the guys we've had on uh, recently within the last few months was a guy named Chad Robichaud, which I know a lot of you remember. And I didn't know a lot of, about Chad when he came on. I, I knew he was from Louisiana. I knew he had served in the military. And so he came on and told us a little bit about his story. Of course, he has a book uh, called Saving Aziz, and we talked about that. But once we started kind of diving into his story and his ministry and what he does, uh, and we got to know him a little bit, Jace, uh, man, what an amazing man. What an amazing ministry. Um, we just we fell in love with him. I mean, he, he, he does amazing things. He speaks all over the country. Um, he, he's a true, a true, um, warrior, I would call him, wouldn't you? Yeah. And I think, uh, the reason we became friends immediately, of course, we took him duck hunting, him and his son, and you learn a lot about a man in a duck blind because mm. you have nothing else to do but sit there and talk. But, uh, it, it just was amazing that how he's a spiritual warrior and, you know, we read these texts about spiritual warfare and, uh, that's what he's doing and you know in love and truth and goes around the country and speaks and uh so we're constantly you know interacting with him since then just in the the way he's using his platform for the lord which is awesome he's helping a lot of a lot of warriors so he has a foundation called mighty oaks foundation and they're also now supporting our podcast uh, by advertising here with us. And so, you know, a lot of times you guys are asking us, what can we do to support the podcast? You know, who, who are some, who's somebody you can aim us to? And uh, we fully endorse uh, these guys and what they're doing. Uh, they've served over 400,000 veterans. Uh, they have had over 4,500 people go through their legacy program. Uh, they provided over 350,000 books and resources to the military and first responder communities. So they're doing it. Uh, they're on the front lines. They're, uh, they're of course, dealing with suicide, which is way too high uh, in the military and first responder community. They're dealing with divorce, family legacy, all these things. And I love it. They're From Isaiah 61, uh, they're kind of their theme verses to restore the brokenhearted through Christ, to build leaders of uh, in community, to rise up from the ashes. They will be called mighty oaks of righteousness. So this is definitely a group to get behind. So cons we want you to consider giving to their scholarship fund by sponsoring a warrior. Uh, it takes thirty five hundred dollars to to help someone get through their program. But any amount that you give can help, whether it's fifty, seventy five dollars, one hundred dollars, whatever you can do uh, to help those who are struggling with the effects of trauma, uh, leading them to restoration, hope and purpose as they move forward. You can donate now by going to Mighty Oaks programs.org slash unashamed for more information on their programs. That's mighty oaks programs.org slash unashamed. The smallest amount makes a big difference. Help these warriors and support what they're doing. We certainly do. To your point, Steve. So it was interesting. You said that because I, I was going to ask you about this. So when we came into the theater, it was 20 minutes of, uh, previews mm -hmm. and it was i think i counted them it was seven horror movies i know that that yeah. were that were uh previewed before the film and in all forms of and it's so funny my wife kept leaning over and said nope nope 
no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every, every time I was like, no, 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 no. And so, you know, but it was the genre. You're right. And, and it was, and, and I looked around and everybody in the theater was about my age. And so no, none of us were going to go see any of those other movies, but you're right. It was the idea that it was speaking into, into that culture. And I thought another thing that was brilliant about the dialogue in the movie It was a very provocative and I thought very effective way to argue some of the issues uh, that that we're very passionate about. And I thought the life issue uh, Mm -hmm. was one of the things. Of course, that's big, of course, for us and especially for my wife and I. But I thought the way that that came out uh, in the discussion, in particular to the character of the, the attorney, I thought was was very very moving and powerful. And I mean, and I and we were both moved, you know, in the moment of watching it. And so that was just another really brilliant way I thought of really dealing with some things, you know, again that that were that made sense in the dialogue that maybe people hadn't thought about. So maybe it was a way to you know convince some people and change some hearts and minds. That's and and that's why we did it. I mean, we we are looking at where this where Western civilization is right now. And that's the U.S. included. And, 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 and guys, we are, we are up against the very boundary to the mouth of madness. Like our toes are right on the flipping line right now. And, and we're about to belly flop into Abaddon right now. We're, we're, we're dipping our toe in the water. Maybe we're, maybe we're ankle deep in the water thinking, eh, maybe it's not that bad after all. And it's very clear going to this culture that is, that is getting affirmation everywhere, maybe in another era. You know, maybe in another era where dads were more old school and distant and it was hard to understand the love of God in my life, that it was like, like, well, you see that in Jesus revolution. In another era, you know, maybe people needed to hear more of a grace message. But in this era, everybody feels affirmed for everything. They're yeah. getting affirmation everywhere. So to try to go to them as a lead pitch and say, um, come, come. Come confess you're a sinner while I tell uh, while I affirm you while I'm nice to you nicer than God to you. Why do I think I need that? Instead, what they need to be shown is the true origin of what they think are smart progressive choices when they're really pagan regressive and destructive choices. They need to be shown what the true origin of that. Uh, where, where these ideas really come from and our and our care and our 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 antagonist. I'm sorry, our protagonist, uh, played by Jordan Belfi, he walks in there, smart, atheist, smug. Yeah. He's got all the answers. He knows it all. And by the end of this movie, he's completely wrecked because he is forced to come to grips with the fact there are forces at work in this world that he otherwise cannot explain. And now he has to go search for what are the answers and antidote to those forces. Well, I just thought, you know, I, I didn't watch the movie, so I did the worst thing you can do. I went to the database uh for movies because before i watch a movie i want to see you know where people rate the movie and uh so i noticed on the movie it was a 7.0 which was uh, above where i would watch a movie i was surprised i thought it would be lower just because i knew where it came from and so i read the comments i browsed through them you know over a hundred and what i quickly found out was that it was either a 10, you know, 9 or 10, or a 1. And the 1, <laughs> yeah. So not bad. So kind of like my watch. show, in other words. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we have something in common, because every project that I've been a part of for the last 25 years, it's either a 9 or 10 or a 1. Yep. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you can look up Duck Dynasty. The, there's a lot of 10s, and there's a lot of 1s. And Mm so, which tells you, you know, people have their mind made up once they put you in this little category. But what I was surprised about, what I was going to say, what stood out to me, because there's so many, you know, people, that that's why this database, you know, I I go there. What I noticed is it kind of like Jesus, it made people mad, glad, or sad, which in Mm -hmm. the production world is is a good thing and the people that were mad were only mad because it was these horror fans that you discussed because they thought Mm -hmm. oh this is going to be some dark you know worldly whatever fits my needs and then i was i was hearing a, a dissertation on 
the origin of evil and, uh, against good. Well, you know, they didn't want anything to do do with that, which I found really funny that one of them who gave it a one said the most horrifying thing was Glenn Beck showed up. And which, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I laughed a lot. But it just shows you that they'd already made up their mind about, yep. you know, how they put people who follow Jesus into a box. Yep. But, but like they also it. said it was well done. It was clever. The acting was good. It was so incredible that they were admitting all the things that make a great movie. Mm-hmm. But it was just mm-hmm. where it came from. They didn't want to give it a well, chance. It brought forth information for me. When Jesus is talking to, to a group of individuals, he said, you're doing the things your own father does. I'll start a little. This is John 8, verse 40. Uh, As it is, you're determined to kill me. This, this much, and they did. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You're doing the things your father does. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus talking. Jesus said to him, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and now I'm here. I've not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. Now listen to Mm -hmm. Jesus' analysis. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. Just look at our culture. He was a murderer from the beginning, Cain and Abel. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He is a liar and the father of lies, Satan. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. If uh, Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Jesus asked him. Where'd I go wrong? They were just sitting there looking at him. If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God, here's what God says. The reason you do not hear is you don't belong to God. The point is, Satan in that text in John 8 is the father of murder and the father of lies and just back up off our culture and look, and you say, and that's what they're all doing, mm-hmm. lying and murder. It's the sad state of affairs, and you're right. The time has come where we better wake up to all this. We're trying to reach out, by the way. There's a constant stream of them that we never saw before, but in the last decade, and it's getting more and more and more, there are a constant stream of individuals showing up. Once a week, we got a little building next to the main church building. They've been watching this podcast, and they say, "Yeah, we saw it. We saw it." So, and this movie you made is going to help a lot. There's a constant stream of them at all times. Every week, we see them. All the states in the United States, they're from all over, other parts of the world, out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You know, I mean, you wouldn't think you'd see people driving and flying that far just to hear about Jesus. We baptize them, preach the gospel to them, and the ones who want to, we baptize them, and the next week there'll be a whole nother bunch there. They're there, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm feeling slowly that there's a, there's a turn, there's a turn that's begun here. So we shall see how big a turn it is, but I guarantee you one thing, that movie you just made helps the cause. That's very kind, brother. And, and that's, we made the movie for two groups of people. Um, first and foremost, we made it for Ninevites. Repentance is potentially still on the table, okay? Um, and and one way that you find out, you know, there's there, there's sheep and wolves. One of my favorite quotes from Augustine, there are many sheep without, but many wolves within. What's happened in the last era with this seeker friendlyism uh, in the church is there are wolves all throughout these our churches now. Um, everyone's a sheep. 
everyone's a sheep. Well, if everyone's a sheep, then nobody is. There, what's the difference between the two? Sheep don't know and need a shepherd. Wolves don't want to know. They don't want to know. They know uh, and have rejected it. They are mal- they're malicious creatures, uh, and we are we have ravenous wolves in many churches. Uh, and it, because um, it, you know, it would separate the crowd. We'd have fewer people here, um, and so when you issue a clarion call, like what you were just describing, Phil, the people that come, Jesus said, "No one can come to me except the Father who sent me sends them to me, and then I will raise them up on the last day." They're responding to the call. That his sheep hear his voice. They're responding yep. to it. All right, but right now we're drowning it out. No doubt about it. Um, yep. We're drowning it out with niceties. We're nicer yep. than God. Um, uh, we're, we're drowning it out with programs, uh, instead of preaching. Think about it. We won't, we won't allow not, we won't allow the very name Jesus Christ not allowed in our school systems. Just mm-hmm. think about it. The damage that did for, for the last 50 years. And we're surprised by the, by our culture. I mean, we're, we're doing it to ourselves. We don't think that there's a great evil power right next door we just don't think like that and we need to change Correct. that and for i mean for a generation born again believers have gone and taught and administrated in those schools and abided by that no other generation of christians in any country con- culture um i mean that's why they had persecutions that's why they were martyrs they refused to comply with with such edicts but we've done this on an institutional level in the west because of the level of financial comfort and cultural comfort we have and yep. the uh, not wanting to risk any of that uh, and the cost of that confrontation we're not willing to pay it and now we're surrounded and so that's the second group of people that we made this movie for uh the the there's a there's a moment early in the film when uh where nefarious looks at james and says are you ready for round two and james says i didn't know this was a fight and nefarious says that's why you're losing yeah and that is aimed square right at our brethren right there yep. uh, you know we we talk about the woke but are you awake are you aware of what's going on do you believe that there is a the 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 long cloud of uh, long the long crowd of witnesses that hebrews talks about the martyrs that came before us do you believe that that line exists because they said nothing about such things in their day because they let it go they thought it was not their place to say anything no they're there uh with their eternal reward because they did that's the thing right now all the religious conviction all the willingness to suffer for what you believe is all on the side of what i call the spirit of the age in in mass the church doesn't have any of that kind of courage or toughness at all and still thinks that you know that that america will ju- is just looking for a purpose driven life no i think you're right and steve is so amazing because in the it, when the uh the attorney defends well you know the we're doing quite well and he he lays out some kind of woke ways that the culture mm-hmm. is doing better. I, I, I just loved it because he's telling this evil spirit about how things are not as bad as it, <laughs> it, as right. it appears. Right. And so right. I just thought that really brought into play kind of the mindset. Again, this is from a, an atheist point of view in the movie. And so it really just played so well to the mindset that was there, which was, which was very powerful. So it, it was so well done brother. And I just, I can't, encourage people especially our audience more uh, to go see the film one is i think we're in an era that we're we're making a difference in this and look this is new for conservatives new for believers Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. be able to have this genre being done so well and so i commend you steve and the team and all the people involved because we're finally getting a great product out there to tell our stories and so i praise god for that and we're sort of in that era. We're, we, we've got a movie coming out as well later this year. And again, it's kind of a, a faith a film buster because it's gritty and it's real. And it's kind of like this. And so I'm mm-hmm. excited to see that God now is, is opening doors for us to do that. And so you guys are helping pave the way for that. Uh, so I want to encourage people to go see the film. Uh, not only to be supported, but it, it's going to it's going to be effective, and you're you're going to have some ways to be able to continue to, uh, the argument, which is powerful. Uh, Steve, tell folks where they can find your books and information and things like that, because it, it made me want to go back and and read everything you've written just watching the film. So tell folks where they can find your books and things like that. Just just a little point. A, a lot of people I've been surprised are coming out of Canada to come. They're driving from Canada are flying mm-hmm. 
to come all the way down to hear a 35 or 40 minute little speech about Jesus Christ. That's what's going on. And it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. So I hope that it couldn't have come at a better time, this movie you just made. I mean, it got my attention. So I was all in, man. So keep it up. Keep up the good work. Bring another one up after this one. I appreciate it, brother. That, that means a lot coming from you guys. Uh, we all have a lot of respect for you and appreciate that. Props for sure. Thank you. And um, you got, if people want to follow my show, they can subscribe to the podcast. All my books are up on Amazon. The one that this movie is based on is called The Nefarious Plot. And if enough people see this movie, we will do the sequel, uh, which is based off the sequel book, A Nefarious Carol. Uh, and, um, you can check at, uh, um, nefarious tickets.com or who is nefarious.com, uh, to see about the film. Is it showing in your area around the country? Uh, we did good enough to make it into the top 10 as an independent film. That's very difficult to do. Uh, but now the fight is on, uh, here in week two to hold on to our screens. Uh, the devil has dropped literally 13 movies on us in this release window in the last two months. All right. So we had to go up against five movies last week that were brand new, five more movies this week, and then another three next week to stay alive in the theater. So we need those of you that have seen the film to be ambassadors for the movie. The word of mouth has been great. Um, but we now need you guys to go and bring your church groups that were maybe leery of the R rating that we didn't deserve and everything else that they've done to shut our movie down. Uh, we need now you guys to have that word of mouth and take those people to church that were maybe leery before, but with your endorsement, we'll give it a chance. And they'll be very pleased with how this movie um, confronts the current spirit of the age. And not to yep. mention, guys, it's also just a really darn good movie. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I agree 100%. It, it got my attention. I'm glad y'all did it. The acting is Thank fa you. fantastic. Really well done, Steve. We appreciate you being on the podcast. Uh, don't forget, guys, starting the week of May 7th, uh, we're not going to be releasing anymore on Sundays. It's going to be Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I know a lot of you spend uh, time with your families on Sundays, and uh, so we're going to have all weekday releases. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So look for that beginning the week of May 7th. Uh, also, if you want to follow us over to our overtime segments, blazetv.com slash unashamed. We'll see you on the other side. Thank you, Steve. Days, keep doing what you're doing. God bless you, brother. All right. Thank you. God bless you guys as well. All right, thank take you. Care, it up. Bro. Keep it up. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.